Yorkton Melville. Thank you, Speaker. I appreciate the opportunity to speak today on a bill which will implement certain measures of the November Economic and Fiscal Update. Although these are trying times for our country, I have every reason to feel hopeful. But it's not because of this legislation. On January 25th, I stood at the side of the road in Whitewood, Saskatchewan, as truckers drove away from their families towards Ottawa. By now, every member of Parliament, and I'm sure almost every Canadian, has seen and heard what these peaceful protesters are asking for. They're in our capital because a whole two years into the pandemic, the Prime Minister has decided to put our supply chain at further risk with a punitive vaccine mandate for cross-border truckers. These are the same truckers that have been going above and beyond to keep our grocery and retail store shelves stocked over the past two years with no issue. At the start of the pandemic, politicians of all stripes, including the Prime Minister, encouraged Canadians to thank a trucker as some of the unsung heroes of the pandemic. Now, a whole two years into the pandemic, his vaccine vendetta will disrupt supply chains further and raise the cost of everyday goods more, impacting our economy and quality of life. Already feeling the pinch of what bills like C8 are doing to our economy, these truckers are losing their means of providing for their families. They are joining doctors, nurses, police, firefighters, teachers, lawyers, members of our armed forces, miners, factory workers, public servants, and so many others whose income has been or will be cut off because of their medical choices. They're not encouraged by bills like this one, which promise even more money for proof of vaccination requirements across the country. It sends completely the wrong message to our economy, to our trading partners, and to Canadians. That's why they're standing up. This convoy has exposed many of the frustrations truckers, farmers, and hardworking families are feeling with this Prime Minister and his government. They're tired of overburdensome taxes and reckless spending. They're tired of heavy-handed limits on their ability to provide for their families. They're tired of a government that is intent on driving Canadians apart. I'm pleased to see that the convoy, which was initially focused on ending a punitive vaccine mandate for truckers, has evolved and bloomed into a voice for all Canadians who fundamentally believe in personal freedom. To see people standing up for their rights and freedoms makes me so proud to be Canadian. Uh Point of order. I have a point of order from the member for uh, Timmins, uh, Bay James. Well, I, I understand that MPs have the right to say whatever they want, including misinformation about our medical community and vaccines. But that is not germane to this issue. We have to debate the. Uh, I, 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 I accept the uh, the intervention. Uh, I'll ask the uh, the member to conti yeah. continue, uh, just to take in consideration what we've heard. The uh, member for uh, Yorkton Melville. I certainly will, Speaker, and I think we need to take all uh, aspects into consideration when we're talking about Canadians and their tax dollars. And fortunately, I was at the last sentence moving into why this impacts our truckers and others so extensively. Truckers gave me more hope for the future of our economy than we've received from this government in almost two years. So why should truckers and all Canadians be fearful of our economic outlook? Look no further than the likes of this bill. The economic and fiscal update increases new government spending by 71.2 billion dollars. Since the start of the pandemic, liberals have doled out 176 billion dollars in new spending that is unrelated to our COVID response. That's according to the parliamentary budget officer who says, and I quote, it appears to me that the rationale for the additional spending initially set aside as stimulus no longer exists. The PBO, Canadians as a whole, and I would even wager the finance minister's own staff know that never ending extreme deficits contribute greatly to inflation. We started off the year on the wrong foot, to be sure. Inflation's hit a 30-year high of 4.8%. But what does this actually mean for Canadians in everyday terms? Let's look at housing. When this Prime Minister took power, the typical home cost $435,000. The cost has almost doubled since to $810,000. Young Canadians looking to buy their first home are facing a perfect storm of runaway inflation and a lack of supply. As a means to combat the housing crisis, this bill proposes to add an annual tax of 1% on the value of vacant or underused residential property directly or indirectly owned by non-resident non-Canadians. I argue this is completely insufficient. 
In our 2021 platform, we proposed a ban on foreign investors not living in or moving to Canada for buying homes for a two-year period, after which it would be reviewed. Conservatives would have also encouraged foreign investment in purpose-built rental housing that's affordable to Canadians. Even if you aren't able to buy a home in today's market, every Canadian is also feeling the pinch at their local grocery store. Chicken is up 6.2%, beef 11.9%, bacon 19.1%, bread 5%, cooking oil 41.5%, white sugar 216 just over the course of one year. 60% of Canadians are finding it difficult to feed their families. That figure has increased 36% from when the same question was asked in 2019. These prices affect every normal Canadian, maybe not the Prime Minister. So I just want to say to him, I want to put the concerns of some average Canadians on the record. Lindsay tells me her grocery bill for family of four was once $200 a week and is now $400. She thought she was overbuying, but confirmed that it was the same items and the same quantities. Robin, a tattoo artist, says the nitro gloves he buys were $9 per box two years ago and are now $27. Carol reports the price of groceries, clothes, medicine, gas, everything one needs has shot up. Susan believes absolutely everything has increased in price. The gas tax on her power and energy bills is $100 before she even begins to pay for the usage. Dennis has found that groceries and especially eggs and products have gone up, but also sees increases across the board, including, of course, a rise in lumber and fuel. Noel sees everything has gone up and notes utilities are through the roof. Speaker, inflation creates a dangerous spiral. Increased costs borne by the service industry, utility providers and large corporations are passed along to the consumer. Just as the carbon tax is a tax on everything, the inflation tax punishes hardworking Canadians the most. It's important to remember that added pressure like the carbon tax and inflation occur directly due to the poor choices of this Liberal government. This government chose to introduce a carbon tax at $20 a ton and said that we were misleading Canadians when we predicted they would raise it to $50. Now we know they plan to raise it to $170 a ton. That is a choice the government has made and Canadians are literally paying the price. The just inflation tax is hitting families hard at the grocery store, the garage, on the farm, and when they sit down at night to pay their bills each month. Rather than address the highest inflation in over 30 years, this bill is adding another $70 billion of spending as fuel for the fire. As a result of these choices, two in five Canadians believe they're worse off than they were last year. Adding to their fears, the Liberals have not provided a plan for our way out of this pandemic and to get public spending under control. In yesterday's Calgary Herald, Chris Nelson warns that endless deficits and a weakening dollar will drive up the cost of imports, imports making inflation even worse. He says a rock and hard place doesn't even come close to describing the spot Canada is in. And he suggests a surefire way to prevent this would be to invest in our innovative, productive and export driven oil and gas sector. It provides $68 billion of a bump in our exports each year. Even that, even though that, the environment minister is determined to eliminate it outright in 18 months. It's a perfect example of why these liberals are doing far more harm than good when it comes to our economy, job growth, and the impact on the environment around the world. Canada should be playing a leading role, and we're not. Rather than passing this bill and aimlessly spending more, what are the common sense solutions to get our economy moving again? My mind is immediately drawn back to the truckers and how we can keep them all moving safely. This government should respond quicker than it has to the need for rapid tests as a means of better controlling the spread of COVID at the federal level, their responsibility. Instead, they want to further restrict mobility rights. The Liberals have limited Canadians' ability to fly or take a train without proof of vaccination. They argue that these measures are motivated by scientific recommendations to control the spread of the virus, but they're con contradicting what medical officials, officials of health have stated, that those fully vaccinated are also carriers and spreaders of the virus. I believe the more appropriate measure would be to require all passengers to provide a negative rapid test prior to travel, respecting the mobility rights of all Canadians. Speaker, let's safely but permanently restore in Canada a spirit of hard work, free will, and unbridled innovation. Let's defeat this bill, which only serves as a, as a discouraging reminder of ending 
unending economic malaise and heavy-handed control. Let's provide all Canadians with the ability to work and contribute to our post-pandemic recovery, no matter their medical status. Commentaire, questions and comments. The Honourable Member for Winnipeg North. Mr. Speaker, once again uh, today on the debate on C8, we see the Conservative Party taking that very hard right uh, turn uh, as, uh, you know, I'm surprised and quite disappointed that the Conservatives seem to want to defeat a very important piece of legislation. My question to the member is in, C in C8, we are seeing over $1 billion going to pay towards uh, rapid testing. My question to the member is, does the member believe that Ottawa should not be paying for rapid testings? Does she want the provinces and territories to be paying for it, Mr. Speaker? Who should be paying for it, if not Ottawa? Who would the member suggest that uh, pay that bill? Honourable member for Yorkton Melville. Thank you, Speaker, and I thank the member for his question. Listen, our problem here is what this government chooses to do with the vast majority of the money that it is printing, printing, and spending carelessly. That is the focus. Just as our focus in regards to those who speak up across this nation have the right to be heard on issues that impact them as taxpayers and those who are going to be footing this bill. I would like to ask, and I wish that I could have the opportunity to give my time to this member to answer why he supports a prime minister who calls everyday Canadians racist and misogynists and refuses to meet with those who he basically calls untouchables. I have posted on my page an article this morning from an individual that lives in downtown Ottawa called A Night with the Untouchables. And I would encourage every member of parliament in this house to take a look at what that article says and ask the questions. Why are they not down? Why is their leader, the leader of this country, not speaking to everyday Canadians? And Continuing on with questions and comments, uh, the Honourable Member for Timmins, James Bay. I'm, I'm just, I'm feeling like microaggression. I'm having fingers pointed at me. I'm just asking all the members over there just to be a little more civil. Thank you. So I guess that's a point of order, point of order. I guess we'll look over at the member for Calgary, Rocky Ridge. I'm actually speaking on the same point of order. And um, let's, let's be serious here. I mean, the member for Timmins, James Bay, heckled the member from Yorkton, Melville throughout her speech and heckled members on this side throughout the speech and now rises on a point of order to uh, claim that he is the victim of some kind of... Uh, 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 anyway, the, the, bring the. Um, I, the member, the, the, I'm hearing a lot of debate here. I'm not seeing a point of order. Uh, the honourable member for uh, Timmins James Bay. Yeah, I, I, just, I just have to protect my reputation here. As a, and I, I see that the member actually fell apart in his point of order. Uh, I, it's hard to heckle someone when they're on TV. Uh, you can talk to a TV screen. Heckling is something that's done in the House. So I, I have such respect for you, Speaker. I will not continue uh, putting up with this kind of shenanigans from the Conservatives. Now, we're getting into a lot of debate here, uh, and I'd really like to get back to uh, questions and comments, but I will entertain uh, another one from the member for uh, Battle River Crowfoot. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And uh, uh, I, I believe, Mr. Speaker, that it is... Uh, uh, that's that's that member was very close to the line of referring to someone's presence or absence in the House. And I know that uh, in this hybrid format, those, whether attending virtually or in person, they're, they're, they're entitled to the, the same rights and privileges that each and every member of this House are, are given. So I would ask, Mr. Speaker, that that line be respected within this place. All right, I think we're all ready to, to move on. Uh, I think we were on a question, so the next person that would like to ask a question or make a comment to the member for uh, uh, Yorkton Melville would be, uh, would be entertained at this point. So maybe the member, me the member again for Battle River Crowfoot, I guess. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And I do have a question for the uh, member from, uh, from Yorkton Melville. I appreciate her speech and bringing uh, forward some important points. Um, through, through you, Mr. Speaker, to that member, we see in C8 a, a doubling down on the failed economic policies of a government 
that has led our economy into such a challenging state between large inflation, uh, economic metrics that are all over the map. Mr. Speaker, I'm wondering if the member from Yorkton Melville could comment on that and specifically C8, how it affects those things. Uh, the member for, well, I'll say this, I'll go next to, uh, to Zoom online with uh, the member for Elmo and Tramscona. So I'll let uh, the, the response from uh, Yorkton Melville uh, for the moment. Sure, and I'll be brief so that there are other opportunities. Uh, I would say that what we have here is a, a very good example of very poor mismanagement by this government. And I know that they want to claim that it is the same scenario that we're in, that the rest of the world is in and whatnot. But I can tell you that uh, this country faced the same challenges back in 2008-2009 with uh, a, a collapse of the world economy and our country under the leadership of the wonderful uh, deceased Mr. Flaherty and the Prime Minister Stephen Harper led the world and were highly recognized for the way that we handled the economy during that time. And this government is uh, really impacting all kinds of stress and duress on Canadians with the way it's managing its finances. Still a commentary, questions and comments, the Honourable Member for Elmwood, Transcona. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, you know, I, I do recognize, in fact, I feel myself a lot of frustration with the ongoing uh, public health orders, not because I think that they should be lifted, but because it has been tough on people. And in the face of a crisis, sometimes we're called to do hard things. And I support people's right to protest peacefully, but I have to note that the organizers of this event, you know, have an MOU they've been asking people to sign on to that is about deposing a government in an undemocratic way. They're calling on a committee of their own selection to rule the country with the Senate and the governor general as if this is somehow uh, something that makes sense, uh, both under our constitution and uh, just good principles of, of democracy and government. There have been, I, you know, I've been to a lot of protests. I've been a part of many protests. I haven't seen these kinds of symbols of hate uh, that we've seen, which isn't to say that everyone who supports the cause supports those symbols, but there's a lot of it. And there's a lot of people that have been accosted and harassed in the streets, those are things that I absolutely don't support and that I don't see the leaders of this protest denouncing in any way. I've been part of protests where the leaders have told people to go home because of the activities that they're engaging in that are detracting. Order, order. We'll, we'll move on. We'll ask the question uh, to answer the quick question here, Yorkton Millville. Sure. You know what? I, I totally hear what you're saying. The thing that I think challenges that whole uh, line of thought could be answered very easily if you would take the time, and I, I appreciate this member a great deal, to go and read the article, A Night with the Untouchables, and hear what is not being reported versus what is being reported in our news and from uh, various sources that gives a totally different perspective on this. I agree with him um, that this needs to be dealt with, but I want, I want every member of parliament in this house to have a true sense of who these people are and I would encourage you to do two things. Read the article, A Night with the Untouchables, by someone who just lives downtown. And please, go talk to some truckers. 